Good morning, Walden Church. Thanks for being here. It's so great to see all of you this morning. Today, we're going to start a brand new fall sermon series entitled Living Your Best Life. And I'm going to read from Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as there was none of them. So, how was your week? First week of school, first week back to school. How was your week? Would you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down? You know, with our COVID variants and uh, people we know contracting the virus, it's been a very emotional summer, hasn't it? And people are going to ask that. How was your summer? Teachers are going to ask my two boys uh, when they go back to school, how was your summer? What did you do this summer? And internally, we will check to see if overall we would give summer a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I got a lot done. I went to the beach, visited family, ate some delicious food, had a barbecue. Maybe you went to an amusement park. Maybe you went camping. We'll give it a thumbs up if we got something done. If we accomplished something, then we'll say summer was good. My wife and I, we have two sons. And right after we did the ultrasound, uh, when they were uh, still, still being formed in the womb, we would find out the gender, right? And then you would rush and you would tell your friends. And you probably did this too, right? You'd rush and say, it's a boy or it's a girl. And it's just like, it's just like bagging an eight pound, uh, an eight point buck or catching a really big catfish. An even bigger accomplishment is when they're born. So my firstborn was 11 pounds, nine ounces. And Dermot was nine pounds, 12 ounces and two weeks early. High fives go all around. Dad uh, is, is giving them out. And meanwhile, mom is laying in shock, having just given birth to a purple alien who is about the length of a snake and has the head the size of a watermelon. It happens, right? Right at birth. We are measured, we are sized, we are probed and tested to see if we measure up to see if we're like everybody else, to see if we're normal. Do you have 10 fingers? Do you have 10 toes? Alfred Adler said the only normal people are the ones you don't know very well. We just watched the Olympics these last two weeks. Did you happen to watch uh, high dive? Men's high dive, women's high dive, did you watch that? To me, they were all perfect tens. I mean, one guy does three forward flips, the next guy does three forward flips, and the next, and I really couldn't tell the difference from one dive to the next. But those Olympic judges, they know what to look for. They know how to critique, they know how to compare, they know how to examine one dive up alongside another. And then all of those divers are ranked. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Who decides who's good? Who decides what your worth is? How would you have known if you were living your best life, if someone didn't rank you or judge you? You know, when you were in school, maybe you had a, a shelf and it was full of trophies and your ballet ribbons and your plaques from concerts, uh, certificates that you got from being on debate team, and they might have even let you keep the game ball. But now, all of those things are in a cardboard box in the attic. Now what? Maybe today your diploma is on the wall in your office. Maybe it's in a box in the attic, or maybe, you know, life just didn't go that way for you. What is normal anyway? Is normal having a job? What if you don't have one? Is normal being married? What if that isn't you right now? Is normal home ownership? A white picket fence, 2.3 kids, a dog, a cat, 
two cars in the garage, a thousand followers on Instagram, straight A's, weekends free, nights free, having your own website, having your own studio, having your, uh, all your hair <laughs> or pearly white teeth. Who decides what's normal? When you start comparing yourself to the people on TV or the people with the most followers or even your next door neighbor who has a boat and a lawn that's always green, you'll soon discover the painful fact that when we evaluate ourselves according to the world, it's never enough. No matter what I do, it'll never add up to success. And you'll never find it increasing your self-worth, ever. The world's standards won't ever give me joy or peace. So, how was your summer? Did you get everything done that you set out to do? How is, how is your lawn right now? How is your weight? How is your marriage? What about your faith? Did you draw closer to God this summer? Did you pray more this summer? Did you read your Bible more this summer? Did you have a devotional this summer? Can you hold your head up high because you gave more to the church, you sinned less, you only cussed twice, and you didn't sleep through the pastor's sermon? If that's you, maybe you had a good summer. I think it's pretty easy to see why so many people believe that when they're doing something, then they are living their best life. And if they're doing something good, then God loves them. But if we're not, God doesn't. But the Bible says it's not about measuring up. Romans 5, 8 says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'll let you in on a little secret that none of the podcasts or self-help books will tell you. When the world says one thing, God says another. Something needs to change in us before we do anything else, before we put foot to path, before we, we begin this journey, we need to learn to find our value from some place other than the world and somewhere other than what people think. I mean, do you really wanna be the person who dies with the greenest lawn and the whitest teeth? Is that really the life that you're aiming for? to make the most money, to own a boat? Or would you rather have joy? Would you rather have peace? What about love? You know, the magazines on the checkout stand, they promise, right? Five, uh, five things you can do to get her to like you. <laughs> 10 ways to attract a man. Six steps towards a healthy marriage. Advice, everyone's telling you what you need to do to be loved. The world says you need to work for love. You need to earn love. And if you're not doing, then perhaps you don't deserve love. I'll let you in on a little secret that the songwriters never sing about. When the world says one thing, God says another. Romans 5, 8 says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That means before, right? Before you did anything, before you accomplished anything, before you made anything, before you did anything good, before you did anything wrong, before you, Jesus loved you. And Jesus did something for you before. Jesus gave his gift before. In fact, it says while, right? It says while, while you were still sinners. Meaning while you were in the red, while you were broken, while you were damaged, while you were in debt, in pain, in tears, while you were stuck in a ditch with no way out, Nothing to offer, Jesus did. Jesus accomplished. Jesus worked. Jesus 
made. Jesus gave. Jesus loved. You. Jesus said you had value. Jesus said you had worth and that you were worth saving before you did anything. The Bible doesn't cover the 10 things to make God love you more. It says, this is your love letter. This is your love story. And it stars you. And it's all about how God is already in love with you. God is already crazy about you. Your value is not based on who you are. And before we take this journey together this fall, before you put foot to pavement, before you even start taking notes, your jumping off point needs to be this thought. Value does not come from goals or progress. Value doesn't come from likes. It doesn't come from follows. Value doesn't come from weight gain. It doesn't come from weight loss. Value is not a title. It's not, it's not something like, I'm now a supervisor, so I have value. I'm now a superstar, so now I have value. I'm now a CEO. Now I'm a father. Now I'm a mother. It's not being a teacher. It's not being an executive. It's not being a husband. It's not being a wife. Value is given to you by who made you. Value is given to you by your creator. Listen again to how the Psalms uh, puts it. Psalm 139, verse 13, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame is not hidden from you. And when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. The psalmist reminds us that we are individually handcrafted. Each of us, we're hand-knit, hand-made by God. We are works of art. I heard this last summer. I was watching TV. There was a commentator, and he was speaking about a person, and he said that this person was uh, gender-assigned female at birth. And I had to shake my head and listen again, gender assigned female. But then after thinking about the wording, I approved. I mean, the commentator is absolutely right. This woman was assigned her identity from a conscious mind, from her creator. She was assigned her worth, her value by her creator. And God loves her exactly the way she is. And, and, and she is exactly who she was made to be, and she will never have to try to be anything else to gain God's approval. And the flip side of that is, there's nobody else's approval that you need. The psalmist sings in Psalm 118, the Lord is, my, is on my side, I will not fear, what can man do to me? The Lord is on your side. There's nothing you can do that'll make him love you less. The Lord is on your side. There is nothing you can do to make him love you more. And since this is the beginning, since this is the first lesson in our series, I thought, well, we should just start at the beginning. Start at the beginning, start at the base, start at that core verse that we all know. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We all learn this verse. This verse. But we should also study the context for where this verse comes from. Just as much as we study the words. John 3, 16 and 17 expresses, it communicates the very core of the Christian message, right? It's what we teach little kids in Sunday school. God loves you. God loves you and God wants you to know it. 
That is why Jesus was sent into the world. That is why he lives among us, to suffer for us, to rise again for us. This is huge news. This is earth-shattering news. This is going to change everything. This also changes how we see ourselves reflected in the mirror because this changes our value. This changes our worth. In the story, Jesus is attempting to talk to Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee. And Nicodemus uh, has everything going for him. So he thinks, you know, he's a member of the inner circle of Jewish leaders. He's probably wealthy. He has the right status. He's educated. He's living his life exactly as the world has always taught him. So Nicodemus asks a theology question about heaven, about rebirth, about what it takes to be accepted by God. And Jesus answers back with, wait, I, I thought you were a teacher, Jesus says. I thought you were a teacher. Aren't you supposed to know these things? Jesus says, okay, okay, okay. When you were born, you were already loved by God. And all through your life, God gave you opportunities to draw closer to him. Jesus says, faith is not a birthright. That's what you've been taught. But it's wrong. Jesus says, things like faith are in. Spirit is in. Heavenly things are in. And when you follow and you believe, God will always be in your corner no matter what. And when you fall, when you disobey, when you sin, God is going to be right there to lift you up, to love you, no questions asked. And for Nicodemus, this is a completely new way of thinking. And it's difficult, probably even today, for people to understand. And so as Jesus followers, as Christians, us, the church, it's our job to communicate this message. It's not enough for us to just know John 3.16 or to be able to recite it. We have to live it. The world needs to know that they are loved, not judged, not condemned, not cast aside. They're not too fat. They're not too short. They're not too single. Our job as the church is to shout this message louder than the world. The secret to living your best life is that God loves you. He welcomes you and he wants you to be with him forever and ever. Amen? Jesus says, no, Nicodemus, you have it wrong. It isn't about doing to earn God's love. I came to save them, not condemn them. Jesus' love shows through and it's more powerful than anything else, any other worldly message. And when your neighbors hear that message, they're going to run to church. They're going to run to a community that shows them love, shows them inclusiveness. Because they're going to see a God who is offering something special that they can't receive from anywhere else in the world. Nicodemus was looking at the things in his life from an earthly perspective, from human judgment. Nicodemus is scratching his head, trying to figure out, okay, how do I crawl back inside my mother's womb? Because he's so focused on doing. And he's not being. That was part of his nature. And it's, it's part of ours. You know, we're so concerned about what we have to do who we have to become. We think that happiness and joy, those things are earned, but they're rewards. Matthew 5, 12 says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. God wants to give you greater joy than you can possibly imagine. And the best life is not about what you have to do. It's all about what God already did for you. And what does God do for you? He changes you. He changes how you think about yourself. He changes the person you see when you look in the mirror. And this is the message that really ended up transforming Nicodemus. When we see him the next two times in the Bible, he certainly coming around. 
taking him on that road from where he was so focused on doing and producing to be accepted. He's on the road to what it means to truly follow Jesus. Jesus came to do all the work. Jesus came to save. Jesus came to forgive. Jesus came to offer grace. Jesus came to love. Jesus came and he brings eternal life just as Jesus comes for you. And it's in those moments when we're feeling broken and feeling bad about ourselves and, and, and beating ourselves up for our sin. And, and we're feeling less valued. We don't feel like we measure up. We, we feel like everybody's winning except us. We feel like we're five, 10, 12 steps behind. And all we wanna do is run and hide and turn the lights off and get into our bed and throw the covers up over us and hide. That's when God sits down on the bed beside us and he pulls the covers back on our shame. And like your father, he embraces you. And he lets you know that it's okay. And that he forgives us. And that he accepts us. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what kind of love the father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. You are loved by God. Your value and your worth come from God. You are a human being, not a human doing. Every day this week, I want you to say, I am loved by God. Throughout every single day, I want you to remind yourself, I am loved by God. When you look in the mirror, the only thing I want you to see is that you are loved by God. No matter what life throws at you this week, Remind yourself that you are loved by God. And when you tuck your own children into bed, or your grandchildren, or just before you hang up the phone on them, I want you to remind them. And it's the most important lesson you will ever teach them. You are loved by God. You are loved by by God. Let's pray together. Lord, once again, we are just on our knees in awe of the magnificent, magnificent love and grace that you offer to each person. You are so wonderful, and you are our Heavenly Father. You are our Lord, you are our God, you are our King. And the fact that you know us by name that you know our details, that you want to spend time with us, that you want to get to know us, and that you want us to get to know you is incredible. The creator of the universe, the creator of all time, wants to have a personal relationship with me. Lord, help me to find my value and my worth from you and you alone. May your word always be louder than the world. May your voice through the church always be louder than the rest of the world. May your Christians and disciples everywhere communicate this message. God loves you and accepts you exactly the way you are. Your son came to show community. Your son came to show inclusivity. Your son came to show forgiveness. He was humble. He extended grace. This is our job. This is our calling. To be like your son every day. To show the world the hands and feet of Jesus and to communicate this one message. God loves you. May that be on our lips each and every day. May it be the words we tell ourselves, the words we tell our children, the words we tell our grandchildren, the words we tell ourselves in the mirror, the words we tell our neighbors, the words we tell our enemies, God loves you. God loves you. Amen.
See you guys next week.